fall in love with the business aspects of architecture practice. And architecture business is not an easy business to, to run. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And today we have a very interesting episode because um, I was very honoured and privileged to be a guest on the Anti-Architect podcast, which is hosted by the fabulous Christian Giordano, who is the CEO of Mancini Duffy. They've been on the Business of Architecture podcast a, a number of times once we had them, all of the partners on, and we've had Christian on individually as well. Um, and they're really an incredible, interesting, innovative business in architecture. And I really, really admire what everything that those guys are doing. And um, one of the, the media um, activities that Christian is involved in is this brilliant podcast, The Anti-Architect, where he interviews lots of very interesting people from the industry. So if you're not subscribed to that, go and check it out and, and hit the like and subscribe button. And he invited me on when I was in New York a few months ago, and I was very happily obliged to uh, to to jump on the opportunity and we had a very interesting conversation where we spoke about late payments we talk, talk, talked about some of the difficulties that many businesses face with being able to ensure that their clients are paying them on a regular um, time frame and the difficulties that many even sophisticated businesses like mancini duffy the challenges that they face in making sure that they're being paid on time when and as per contracts. Um, we spoke about podcasting and the opportunities that that provides in somebody's individual career um, for marketing of a, of a firm. Uh, and we talk about more generally the state of the architectural industry and the mistakes that many businesses make when they first set up. They make with their marketing, they make with their keeping projects on 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 target. And Christian um, did a very well-researched uh, podcast and asked me some really pertinent and interesting questions. So I thought we'd share that interview here on this platform in case you're not already subscribed to The Anti-Architect and you haven't come across the interview. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Christian Giordano and myself in conversation. Have you ever had trouble finding an architectural photographer who could really make your project shine? Today's episode is sponsored by renowned architectural photographer, Tobin Davies. Tobin Davies eliminates the hassle by traveling to your location to create the stunning photographs your project deserves. And we are happy to support him here on the Business of Architecture podcast. Visit TobinDavies.com or BayawayPhotos.com to book a shoot in less than 10 minutes and ask about the special offer for Business of Architecture podcast listeners. Again, that's TobinDavies.com or BOAPhotos.com. Hello, Anti-Architect podcast listeners. I am excited to have Ryan Willard all the way from England here in the studio as my guest on the Anti-Architect podcast. Ryan began his journey in architecture with renowned firms like Grimshaw and RSHP before launching his own firm, TTHS Architects. However, the challenges and financial stress of running TTHS drove him to delve deep into the intricacies of business management and learn everything he could about running an architecture firm. His pursuit of knowledge led him to interviewing leading figures in the AEC industry from all around the globe, which culminated in the widely recognized Business of Architecture UK podcast. Over time, Ryan expanded his expertise in areas such as marketing, sales, and the psychology of teams and individuals. Leveraging his relationships with industry experts, business consultants, and leadership gurus, Ryan has gained a profound understanding of the components that constitute a prosperous and influential practice. He currently serves as a director of consulting at the Business of Architecture through the SMART practice, which is trademarked, he has advised over 100 architecture firms, helping them achieve financial success, freedom, and fulfillment. The Business of Architecture is among the premier podcasts in our industry. With nearly 500 episodes, it stands out as a definitive source for insights on the often overlooked aspect of our profession, the business side. I've had the privilege of being a guest on the show multiple times, and several of my partners have also been featured by Ryan. And most importantly, Ryan is a UK-based Bruce Springsteen fan. Yes. <laughs> you know, I was in New Jersey yesterday, and I was in Princeton, 
and they've got a big photo, they've got a big statue of Bruce <laughs> with his guitar and a big shawl on. I had, my, had to get my photograph taken with him. So that's great. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for being my guest here. My absolute pleasure. Um, so you know, I've been a guest on many podcasts, um, and not to offend the others, uh, but my episode um, as a guest on yours on the business of architecture, um, which when I looked is all the way back in March of 2021, wow. um, called uh, Transparency and Leadership. Um, still today, still to this day, gets referenced by people. Mm. Um, you know, you, the reach of your podcast is pretty amazing. Uh, I, I will say, like people have, have said, oh, I heard you on business work. I heard you on business, and and that like blows me away. That you know, it's it's out there, and people people absolutely love it. Um, you know, you've also had my partners on, um, which obviously we we thank you. What what has been the most rewarding aspect of hosting this podcast? Things like this, <laughs> basically. Just the I I was walking around New York yesterday, and I was thinking how privileged I am to be meeting all these amazing, interesting architects all over the world. We have, we at the moment have about 80 different clients who I work with very intimately. You know, I had a client yesterday take me around Princeton, show me all of her buildings, her developments, her projects. There are these really kind of intimate relationships that have been getting gotten built. And the podcast has kind of opened up this enormous network of people that I would never have been able to get into contact with. And it's happened all from basically my little bedroom studio <laughs> in in the East London, <laughs> and and you know, and even the relationship I have with with Enoch, my you know business partner, mm -hmm. he started off in his kitchen in Visalia, wow. and there we were in these two little rooms at opposite ends of the world, and have grown this amazing network, and a business has kind of organically grown from it and we've continued to sort of invest in ourselves with business knowledge and education and leadership and kind of distill as much as we can from it and put it into um, you know a structured program to put to put architects through yeah but i i would never have i mean i only started the podcast for my quite selfishly because i wanted to know well what the hell are other businesses doing <laughs> Because, you know, I was running my architecture firm and very quickly it became, I thought I was good at sales. I thought I was good at talking with people. I thought I had, you know, a kind of sense for that sort of stuff. But there was an element of it that just seemed so ridiculously hard. And like I was almost had a handbrake on. And there were so many things about how I'd been trained as an architect and I had to, I had to do everything. And my kind of I think my financial fluency uh, at, that, at that time was, you know, I was very cautious of it. I didn't understand how to budget a project really. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I'm now managing clients' money. And <laughs> you're like, this is either grossly irresponsible or did I miss, did I, did I, did I sleep through those sessions at college? <laughs> and it's like, no, you never, no one has ever actually yeah. told you or shown you and really gone, gone deep with it. Yeah. Um, so I started the podcast out of that kind of, frustration of not knowing how to do those things. Um, and it just, you know, I just wanted to start reaching out to people who I admired, was interested in, wanted to see what they were doing. And I was always been so touched of how architects all around the world have been so open to sharing, here's what we do. And you know what, we struggle with that as well. Yeah. And you know what, we don't have an answer. <laughs> you know what, we've tried for the last 25 years and it's been really, really difficult. And it was like, great. That's, that's really fascinating. And so I kind of just became obsessed with, with that and kind of just fell in love with the, the, the media side of, yeah. of it as well. And it also you know, enabled me to implement things in my own business and, and to grow it. But yeah. certainly the, the, the biggest thing from the podcast is the, the network and the relationships and the people that that's great. I could never have imagined that was possible. You're right, that architects, a lot of this, and there's always the ones that, you know, they know everything and that's the way it is. But most that I come across, and especially us here, you know, we're the first ones to go, oof, I have no idea what, how to even do this. You know, yeah. where, where do we even begin? You know, luckily we have this internet thing. We can, uh, we can look it up, listen to your podcast. Yeah, Google it, it out. Out. yeah. <laughs> um, so if you had to pick one thing, what annoys you about your fellow architects? <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I, have, I have my annoyances with the industry as a whole because I feel sometimes the way that we view design is very myopic and a bit blinkered and that 
there isn't enough appreciation for business and for profit and for making money. Um, I, again, I mean, I sometimes say this, this is, I, there's a difference between US business culture and the UK business culture. And I find here as a generalization, um, entrepreneurship and business is more celebrated. In the UK, we pretend that it's not happening. Yeah. And we sometimes pretend that, you know, profit is a dirty word. I mean, that happens here as well in, sure. within the indus architecture industry. Um, but that, that I feel is grossly irresponsible. It's a culture thing that's developed from university. It's un I, un I appreciate it's unintentional. There's no one at university telling us business is bad, but through the negation of our education, which is so focused on a very specific part of design as well. It doesn't yeah. talk about how we're actually dealing with other human beings, how we're communicating and problem solving as teams. And the gestation period of an architect is unnecessarily long. And it means <laughs> that we come out and we've been very deeply indoctrinated with a, a particular design philosophy, which then ends up hurting us when we start trying to run a business. And then we have the audacity to wave very meaningful and important flags of how we want to change society, sustainability, diversity, inclus inclusivity, but yet we're failing to be financially responsible in our own businesses and actually feed ourselves before we can go off and help anybody else. And, yeah. it, and it means that that that, that, I, that just doesn't sit well with me and and it's frustrating. And that's part of the mission of the business of architecture is profit for purpose. Like we've got to get really serious about making money in the business, put it as a priority, learn the mechanisms that are involved in, in doing that and have the culture of the business where everybody is, understands we're running, we're running an organization here, we're doing it for money, we're doing it for profit. And guess what? We've got values and a philosophy that means that we can reward our team members well, we can up-level the, the, the kind of... Uh, you know, the, the, the careers and the salaries and the team of everyone involved. And also we can use our profit to, to have agency, yeah. to, to make a difference in the things that we want to do, so. Very well said. And so, so how on the academic side do we begin to change this and that, that part of the education process? Because, by the way, I agree. Mm -hmm. the, I don't understand why architecture is five years long. Yeah. I, that, that ne I never understood that. It's just to do one more studio or whatever that might be. It, it never made any sense whatsoever. It and is. now with college being more expensive, well, it, it, it's it, just more debt. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's an enormous uh, length of time. I'm quite happy for people to, you know, I think the academic world should have, you should have a course called Architectural Thinking. It should be divorced from actually becoming an architect. I think architectural education is fantastic in and of itself, and there's lots of benefits of doing that. And academics will actively say, well, the purpose of education is not necessary to feed the industry. Okay, well, then tell your students that, <laughs> because they're investing a lot of money to become an architect. Yeah. And academics are quite proud in the fact that we're not produ we're producing thinkers. That's another, qu that's another question <laughs> that, we'll, that we can get into another time. But... There is a there is an investment that students are making to become an architect and architectural thinking and strategy is fantastic and you can have it as an isolated design subject and you could do a master's in it and spend a PhD in doing it. But that doesn't that doesn't need to be the only way to becoming an architect and you could very easily have a degree which is three years long or even you don't even have to go to university. And I think mm -hmm. actually having a... a uh, a, a, a more apprenticeship scheme, which we're starting to see happening, but having people who are trained in practices yeah. and certainly larger practices could start to um, have more of an active role in education. And guess what? They should be allowed to charge people for education as well or have yeah. it as another business revenue stream where you've got educational components that can be digitized and people can be downloading it and they could be training themselves and then that can give them access to then perhaps becoming in, employed as in, interns and, and things like that. Yeah. And, you know, there's lots of, there's lots and lots of different routes into becoming an architecture, but a lot of them all come from, first of all, let's just share the experience of being in an office and not remove the reality of the economic force that shapes architecture. Please, let's, let's play with it. Let's talk about it. In academia, I've, I, I struggle to understand why we become so well versed in being able to 
deal with all of the other forces that shape architecture from from imagined socio-political things to environmental to tectonic to philosophical to arts-based but money is left to the side mm -hmm. and very rarely even when we do something as practical as design a, a building to any kind of budget at university mm -hmm. that's insane <clears throat> that's yep. absolutely insane how can we how can our clients be investing huge amounts of money if they're talking to people who are not fluent in the world of, of finance of course we're not trusted as, yeah. as, as and professionals, we shouldn't be. Yeah. We shouldn't be. Because we <laughs> haven't been we haven't been trained in that. I tried to explain my my parents, I come from a family, a long lineage of, of accountants. <laughs> and interestingly, I always fought against accountancy and now I'm kind of professing that, professing yeah. the same things, but in a very different way. And I have conversations mm -hmm. with my with my parents. And my mum was a was a, an accountancy teacher at um at, at kind of kind of uh, colleges and she was often like, yeah, but she's like, but in accountancy, when we teach, it's very different from the real world. And I was like, yeah, but in academia and architecture, I think it's almost unrecognizable from yeah. the real world. At least in accountancy here, you're talking about theoretical, hypothetical situations and you're missing things out. In architecture, you can get into a world of complete fantasy that's t completely not underpinned by any kind of real reality. Right. I don't want to undermine that completely and say it's useless because it does have its value. And what we're also starting to see is that a lot of the value is actually appreciated more in other industries who require that kind of thinking. And then Absolutely. we look at tech platforms, they pinch very creative architects and yep. they start paying them massive salaries. Yep, developers, yeah. it, 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 construction side, there's a lot it, of people it, that pull them. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. exactly. It, it, it makes sense. Yeah, I think about you know my architecture, uh, my undergraduate and I was lucky at the University of Miami in Florida, they had most of the professors worked. They had either they worked at larger companies or they worked um, for themselves. Right. So yeah. there was a little bit of that, which was interesting. But you never talked budget. You mm -hmm. never talked anything as far as, you know, how much would something cost? If you, if you even thought that way, I remember we had a, a student who did a, a final presentation where his building floated. You know, and it was like you even ignored gravity. It's not only budget, but gravity. That's amazing. You know, and listen, it, it was cool. I get it, you know, and definitely got A's for sure on that. Yeah. Right. Um, but then you get into a situation where you, you have students that now are out of school. They come to a firm and it can be pretty demoralizing and deflating where it's you know, you're, we're not doing that. There's a budget and they can't afford this or you may have designed this or worked on it, but now we have to redesign it because the client can't afford it. And, yeah. you know, I don't care. I don't care what architecture firm you work at. It, I mean, with maybe the exception of some of the Black Cape architects, mm -hmm. budget is always part of the process. It yeah. really is, you know, and, and that's well, that. I mean, what's interesting is, you know, <clears throat> I, a lot of the work that we do with our clients now really puts an emphasis on them understanding the budget of the client, not just what the budget is, but how are they coming to that number? How are they devising it? Where is their money coming from? If you're working for developers, what's their investment cycle like? What are their financial cycles like? Where are they having issues with their own liquidity? How can you now start to structure your own offer and design process that kind of complements where they're where they're um, where they're having cap dips in their cash flow. Oh, and guess what? You can make more money by doing that and not actually provide any more additional service. Yeah. You know, things like you recognize a client has a, um, you know, they 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 don't have that much money for the soft costs up front for a piece of architecture. Then great, okay. Then what happens if you start charging a base rate of fee and then you negotiate an uplift or a bonus type of structure on the amount of units that gets put onto a site or mm -hmm. if approvals get comes on again you're starting to play the game of taking risk your business needs to be working foundationally yeah. to be able to start taking that kind of risk yeah but we start seeing people who are now getting paid three times as much money as they would have done for a regular service because they've understood and they've taken the time to absolutely just be fluent with the with their client about how does it, how's your budget working yeah. because there's a there's a design process there and developers, are, we often think of developers not being very creative, but they absolutely are. Oh, they absolutely are. When yeah. it comes to deal making, financing, how yep. they're doing that, that kind of stuff. And that's, I think that's really fun, interesting. And there's a whole world of just talking about that at university where, you know what, we could actually use the safety of university to be experimenting with these sorts of 
risk type structures where you're not going to lose hundreds of thousands of, of dollars yeah. and actually start speculating about what kind of business model would you need to deliver this sort of project or what kind of business model would you need to serve the kind of client that you're uh, kind of speculating about in your academic work. I, I, I think that's really interesting and there's, you know, it, it just starts to give people a bit of hunger um, about making money in architecture. And, I, and, I, and it's interesting because we, on the podcast, we get a lot of students kind of contacting us saying, I want to set up my own business. I want to become an architect developer. I'm not learning anything about this at university. I'm worried about actually continuing with this, with this program. Do I stick in university or should I go out and try and sell a product, start a YouTube channel? And, <laughs> and we see all this sorts of stuff. And I, I that's think, great. I think you know, that, that's really, I mean, the appetite is there for it. I don't necessarily think the academic world has the ability to necessarily serve it. And we also forget that the academic world, the universities are brands and they are businesses themselves and they need to get bums on seats and they need, to, they need to sell their own programs. And the way that they sell the, their programs is to ensure that it's the most sort of compelling, tantalizing, easy thing for them to market <laughs> and perpetuate their own message. <laughs> <laughs> um, so last question about just architects in general. Why do you think architects give away free work so much because they don't know how to either partly kind of reflecting what I've just what, what we were just talking about um, I think the the giving away free work becomes uh, the the only thing to do when there's a lack of other options and it becomes there's there's loads of stuff here there's there's part kind of lack of self-esteem to do with it um, you'd never see a lawyer giving away free work. I was trying to, I was, I was trying to get a lawyer to just to talk about my immigration status here, um, and I, I, I was emailing a few of them, and not a single one would even talk to me, even look at my face without two hundred dollars. And I was like, why am I surprised at being surprised about this? Mm -hmm. That's great. That's exactly like as an industry, they've got that on lock. Yeah. And as an industry, they're not afraid of making 40 to 50% profit margins. And that's what they orientate their, their business around. Mm -hmm. Architects, we're not talking about money. We're not, it almost, the, again, the, the negation of it in university means that we don't, we don't talk about it, we don't focus about it, and we end up repelling it. And al almost thinking that profit is a dirty word that's, you know, it will undermine our creativity. So I don't want to get involved in, in talking about that. Yeah. So then we get into a habit of not talking about money. Then we become, we see a project. We really, really, really want it. The developers or whoever it is that we're working with, they're normally pretty sophisticated financially. They know how to do um, negotiate. They also know how to leverage a risk with consultants who they can either pay late or they know mm -hmm. that they can ask for free work and they can dangle a carrot and, and do that in front of. And so we find ourselves in this in these situations where we're giving away free work and it's kind of undermining everyone else in the profession, but it's the only tool that we've got to be able to try and secure secure a project. Yeah, listen, um, I, I have mixed feelings on it because I, I know that there are times where we've done, let's say, a free study. Mm -hmm. You know, we a developer has approached us and said, hey, there is a site. Can you do a study of this and we'll create a project? Um, and we've gone and done it, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes that project becomes a real project. Sometimes it never goes anywhere. They probably just kind of scammed us into getting some free work kind of thing. Um, so it's a very difficult balance, right? And mm -hmm. you don't want to not get that project. It's like, all right, if I spend 10 grand doing the work now, well, I could make, you know, 2 million if this, you know, giant residential tower goes forward, right? And yeah. That, that's a great payoff, right? Yeah. It's part of marketing is how we'll always like, yeah. you know, bullshit ourselves basically. Yeah. Um, but then there's others where it's perpetual free work. Mm -hmm. And I will say where we, you know, if you're not real and you're not willing to kind of show us that you're real, we're not going to do that yeah. kind of work. I, I think there's, you know, there's if, if, if it's existing relationships with clients, there's yeah. a time and a space for doing free work to kind of continue the relationship. And, and, and there's also been a training, if you like, of the client knowing that they're going to pay you for something. Yeah. There's also kind of structuring services 
in what we might call like a low commitment consultation where as long as there's some exchange of money, even if it's like a reduced exchange yeah. um, for a small piece of pre preparatory work, then great. We're still kind of maintaining that relation that there's a there's a, a trans a transaction to it. Yeah, I think what's very kind of most exploitative I, I, competitions in a lot of yeah. senses. I think only for the very large practices is that even a sustainable way of doing stuff. When I was at RSHP. Uh, which is Roger's practice there, that he, they did maybe eight or nine competitions in a year and they were incredible designers and they knew they had the chops and they knew that you know, the statistics were one of them comes off, then we'll, They're set. we're set. Yeah. They also had a process of kind of basically reusing the ideas from each of the different That's competitions and <laughs> kind of like, you know, making sure that it, it was a, a more simplified process. But that can be enormously expensive for a practice to be doing it, particularly for younger, smaller practices. I mean, the Guggenheim um, competition in Helsinki a few years back was an absolute criminal yeah. disaster of having thousands of young practices just investing time, energy, then barely getting much marketing collateral out from Guggenheim themselves. Okay, sure, they've got some nice pictures. They've still got to generate traffic for it to be going to be yeah. to be seen, and then the pack and then the practice that that won the project they get a stipend. They're not able to negotiate their fees fully, um, and then the project doesn't even happen. Yeah, and they have taken enormous risks to 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 make that thing happen because it could be so game changing. I'm sure you know that particular practice they they did get a lot of marketing and publicity as a result of it. But there's a huge kind of this is so much risk. And and listen, I, risk. I think some of those bigger ones are rigged too, because it, it, somehow you know the you know Morphosis, Gary, uh, Foster, you know all those that are in with hundreds of others. Somehow one of them gets one, and then the next guy gets one, and the next guy gets one, and you know it's like fine. You want those, you know, just hire them direct. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, this is it. I mean, I was chatting to somebody the other day on the podcast. Uh, practice in London does a lot of affordable housing. Um, uh, in in the city and the local authorities in London have framework agreements so you have to kind of submit a whole lot of information you go through a preliminary set of interviews and then you're put into a pool of sort of 20 other architects and now you're allowed to bid for work when it comes up doesn't mean that you know they're equally going to distribute it amongst that 20 which I think would probably be a better idea yeah. um, because you, now you've got 20 architects. They're all competing against each other. They all know each other mm -hmm. as well. They all think very highly of each other. And, and they all, and then, you know, this practice I was talking to, they did the numbers and they were spending about a quarter of a million quid sure. doing, you know, proposal after proposal after proposal in a period of, I think it was two or two years or so, but it was an enormous investment of money. And it was like, well, is this actually working? And if we're doing it, then, all these other practices are doing it. We know them. We trust them. Why can't we just divvy up the work between us? Right. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just want to talk about your your prior firm. Um, so there are many consultants, you know, for architects, large firms like Swig, uh, who have had on this podcast, uh, PSMJ. There are business operating systems, coaches, EOS, Scaling Up, yeah. Rockefeller Habits, Jim Collins. I could list. You know, it goes on and on. Right. Um, but I think what makes you and business of architecture so interesting is that you started and built and ran your own firm, um, for almost 10 years, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, just talk to me about sort of that firm experience, you know, and, you know, what that was like for you sort of creating that firm and then ultimately seeing and, and morphing it into what it is today. Yeah, I, I. So I started off, you know, kind of came out of um, Roger's practice um, and very quickly had to kind of, you know, I was designing whiskey distilleries and museums and large scale stuff. And then suddenly it's down to, you know, rear end extensions on people's <laughs> houses. And that was a bit of a, a mental jump that took me a while to, to get into. And you suddenly realize this big, this big void. And I think I, I, you know, I did set, I did set up my business quite young. I was in 31, 32. Mm -hmm. And on reflection, I, I would kind of probably recommend or 
I mean, it's all worked out really well <laughs> now. But if I was giving advice to my younger self, I would, I would say, learn loads more about business, um, stay at one of these practices for another 10 years, <clears throat> um, and then build up good working relationships and then make good relationships with one of these clients and then <laughs> do that and take some people with you. And then you can go off and, and, and operate a larger, a larger firm much more, much more quickly. Right. Um, but the, the, the initial days of running, of running TTHS, were you know i was asking a lot of small firm architects solo 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 practitioners how are you winning work what are you doing how do you set fees and you know i wasn't earning that great of money as an architect working in a firm and then when i started running my own practice then it really hit me the the pain of being broke Mm -hmm. and that was a very profound and enlightening enlightening experience um that got me very interested in the business aspects of it and i hired a business mentor um and he was really instrumental in helping me understand business systems learning marketing learning sales um you know modeling the business that i wanted on other people's businesses which is part and parcel where the podcast actually came from learning to outsource delegate realizing as a small firm owner actually i can outsource loads of chunks of work i don't have to do everything myself yeah. and you know we started finding people in places like bolivia or in latin america and i could pay them you know a lot less than i could hire someone in the uk and the work was was better faster quicker and i didn't have to be the one doing all the drafting and you're like yeah. oh wow this yeah. became and you can go and sell your services it, now. exactly now yeah. i can go off and sell my services and i can market and now i feel more confident in being able to 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 you know to take on bigger things um and so and that became quite a, a successful kind of small business operating model and i did my last project active project dths about two years ago which was a private house in in aruba um and there was a point where I was kind of, do I want to spend more time in, in the architecture or do I want to spend more time doing business of architecture? And business of architecture was really taking off and was a lot more of a, a compelling, <laughs> a compelling vision, to be honest. Yeah, for sure. That's great. And so, yeah, absolutely. So tell me a little bit about your origin story. You know, where did you grow up? Did you always want to be an architect? Yeah, I grew up in South London. And um, so I'm pretty mixed in terms of my heritage. My mum is Guyanese, which is a small country above Brazil, next door to Venezuela, okay. of Indian origin. My dad is uh, English and, and in Tottenham. And I grew up in South London and probably showed an aptitude as a kid for being interested in maths, physics and art. And some bright spark somewhere said, <laughs> then you need to be an architect. And from a pretty early age, probably about the age of 14, I decided I wanted to be an architect. Okay. And, you know, went to Barcelona and fell in love with Gaudi and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, but never really, again, I think that's interesting in, as a kid, I was pr interested in art and design and stuff, but really, and, and this is something that I, I learned with a business mentor was we started doing lots of personality profiling tests. Hmm. And one of the things that came out was communication. And one of, I, I think in my own personal career as an architect, working in practice, working for myself, one of the frustrations was I want to be talking with people more. And architecture does have that as ability, but certainly working for somebody else. I was in an office by myself, yeah. drafting. Cranking away. Cranking away. <laughs> and I used to be the one that would go and sit with the comms team what are you guys doing? You're on the phones all day. You're talking to people like you're out there, you're doing media based stuff. Um, I would often ask, can I, can I present something? Can I talk with the clients? No, 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 no. Yeah. You, you get that. That, that was very deeply frustrating and working with a business mentor, um, kind of pulled out. He was like, well, actually your personality is you're a communicator. You should be out with people on talking and doing this kind of stuff. I was like, I know. <laughs> And so that, that, again, that was another thing that kind of made me shift career trajectories, if you like, and to let go of architecture and be at peace with, with letting go of the design yeah. work, which is for the most part, for me personally, a lot of, you know, the, I don't enjoy design that much. Right. 
even now we're doing our own little apartment in in up the road in in Harlem and I've barely been involved in the design project my partner she has done pretty much all of it and I've been you need to talk to this person you need to meet <laughs> this person he can help she can help so have you moved to the United States now not quite okay not you're, quite. You're, it's, it's, you're working it's a work it? in process yeah <laughs> um so let's talk about the business of architecture. Um, it's more than a podcast, obviously. I mean, you've referenced that before. And at the end of the day, it's a resource for uh, for, for, for firm owners uh, around the world. Um, I guess my question is, what what are some of the... Um, how do you choose your, your topics and your guests? Um, that's a very good question. Nowadays, Enoch and I are focusing more on doing interviews with each other. I noticed. Because we're able to craft a kind of more kind of curriculum, if you like. Mm -hmm. And we feed off a lot of the questions and the comments that we get from listeners. And so we've always viewed the podcast as being like a kind of conversation with the, with the industry mm -hmm. and for it to be less one way directed of us talking, if you like. Sure. So even though that's what it is with a, with a podcast, but you're broadcasting, but then you get feedback, you get engagement and the, the conversations, the questions that people are asking then informs how and what we're going to talk about next. So that's always been something we've been very, uh, cognizant of and we've also I, I, I mean it's a bit on a on a in a way there's a kind of a tension level so when we look at our podcasts and we recognize that people watch them the ones that often get the biggest views there's always certain words that are in the headlines okay low fees for example or architect developers that that yep. one often comes up or career changes or so they're often there are definitely sort of pain point topics mm -hmm. that do really really well that kind of that are, that, are, that are popular that we kind of use to curate what's the what the kind of what the next podcast is going to be or what the next topic is going to be sure nowadays as well um because the podcast has grown from being where we're interviewing lots of industry thought leaders and kind of distilling knowledge and understanding business innovations and what other people are doing. And now we've, it's kind of grown into our own consultancy where we've got an active program with clients. We have a very immediate feedback loop, if you like, to what are people dealing with? What are the pain points? What are the problems? How is the economic situation impacting businesses? So the yeah. complaints and the troubles and the challenges that I'll experience on a day-to-day -day basis actually talking with, with architects who I'm working with will often inform the, the podcast and the types of um, clients and guests that we, that we have on. The other, the other part of it is, that, um, the, is how active people market to us to be on the podcast. Mm. So we have a, these days we have a lot of people who um, put their name forward to do it. And then so we have a process of screening screening guests sure and we get booked out for like it's a bit ridiculous now it's kind of six months in advance and it takes wow. too long and we're trying to trying to increase the amount of uh, you know content that, that to me produce. was the weirdest thing when people reach out to me and say hey i'd like to be a guest on your podcast and i thought oh wow okay yeah you start to see how it <laughs> yeah. works and 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 the you know the <clears throat> i have good relationships with prs as well mm -hmm. and prs are, are fantastic and they get a, a listening for the podcast and they'll often like a good pr will will contact me and say i've got this client they're doing this innovation in their business yeah um we think it make a really good story here's some things that we could discuss and if it looks good and they've you know put it in a great way i'll jump on the phone with the pr and talk a little bit more and then they'll invite in, introduce me to their to their guest and yeah. we can do that i mean nowadays um you know, I'm kind of more interested in sort of leadership issues and topics and really looking at businesses that are doing certainly innovations with the way that they're structuring their fees, how that they're how they're commanding and protecting profit margins. 
um, how they're negotiating and the firms that are transparent and wanting to talk about that are some of my some of my favorite yeah. ones and, yeah. and you know you guys for example yeah. allowing us to have the whole the whole leadership team was was yeah. a fantastic unique experience and, yeah, we're an um, open book for good or for bad. I, I, you know, we big, share everything, right? It's, it's brilliant. Yeah. And because what that that allows me to do as well, when I hear that kind of stuff, um, I'll, I'll use that when I'm when I'm talking with clients. Go and listen yeah. to this this podcast that I did with Mancini Duffy, because it's it's a it's a big difference when it's coming from an architect who's in the field <laughs> doing it, and here's how they've here's how they've they've done it, and here's yeah. the story, and here's an example. So that as well, it kind of becomes very important. I'm very interested in speaking to architects who are actively engaged with the business and who are innovating and they celebrate it. Yeah. They celebrate it. I mean, that's really the main, if, if you want to build a business of architecture podcast, just celebrate business. Yeah, but absolutely. It's as simple as that, really. How'd you meet Enoch? <laughs> LinkedIn. Oh, really? Yeah. And um, in fact, I, me and Enoch, uh, Enoch and I, we had, we had a relationship uh, digital online for many years before we actually met in person. Wow. Probably for about four or five years. Wow. And I was just saying earlier, actually, uh, I met Enoch in California recently and it was the first time we'd been in the same room since 2019. Oh, wow. Okay. It's, it's extraordinary. <laughs> it's extraordinary. But I, I was listening to his podcast originally. So he'd probably done maybe a year or so or two years of, of the business of architecture out of his kitchen. And I wanted to interview people in the UK and I found Enoch on LinkedIn and sent him an email and said, hey, I'm in the UK. I want to interview UK architects. Can I put them onto your, on your platform or can, I, can we share it or some, something like that? And he was like, absolutely, great. <laughs> Jumped on a call together. Um, he told me what he was doing in terms of, of interviews and then that was that really. That's great, that's great. Um, so. Talk to us a little bit about the consultancy side of business of architecture. Um, what size firms do you work with? You know, how, how big is your staff at this point? If mm-hmm. you're consulting with a ton, it's obviously not you alone, mm-hmm. you know, doing all of this work. How does the actual, you know, physical part work? There's there's four of us in the in the team now. So we have um, three of us are, are consultants. Um, and then we've got an office manager who deals with all of our communications and Kind of liaising with with clients, we have a a kind of an array of different services. The practices that are probably the sweet spot are between the five and twenty okay. range because there's they're mature enough that they've got basic systems in place. They've got some ability to uh, to be winning work, um, mm-hmm. and then there's a lot of there's a lot of good things that we can kind of build upon. And they're looking to go from you know, good to great and they're ambitious and they, they want to be making the business work. Right. We have a we have quite a few solopreneurs okay. um, and startups and uh, and I think that's really great because we often hear from the practices who have been in business for 30 years saying, I wish I'd done this, yeah. you know, yeah. right, right at the beginning. Yeah. But that's a slightly, they have a slightly different set of needs and requirements. And normally it's about getting money into the business as quickly as possible building up a pipeline, which is reliable. Um, And we set a kind of set of benchmarks. We have a thing called the 200 Club, which is uh, what we would gauge a high performance business, which means that for every full-time equivalent employee in the business, the business is bringing in $200,000 per per annum. That's our metric as well. Fantastic, yeah, yeah. and I mean, and it and it really it's it's a challenging one to to get yeah. to. But We'd it, like to push it to two fifty, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Um, and it, and it's and it's great because it's one of, the, one of the first things we do when we have any business come on is we do a very kind of thorough audit for three months, look at what financial processes and systems they've got in place, how are they measuring profit, how are you tracking profit into, in in various projects, where are you where are you leaky. How are you negotiating, mm-hmm. and where are you in, with using this this two hundred metric? Because that will that's the doesn't tell everything, but it well, it, it, it certainly gives us a good indicator. Yeah, and you know, if, if a business is below one hundred thousand, I'm like, okay, well, we're not going to do anything until we've bought, we've built a pipeline, and we can see at least in theory you could get to, to two hundred. Yeah. yeah, and it means we can start opening up. Um, how are you setting your fees? What are you looking at? What are you tracking? What's your hourly billing rates? Where are you? What kind of profit margins are you are you having? Yeah. So we look at all we look at all of that, and we have a, a kind of the first 
benchmark, if you like, is to become what we call a rainmaker. Mm -hmm. So once you're a rainmaker, it means you've got a pipeline, you're able to win work, um, and you've got the ability, or you already are at 200,000, you're in the 200 club. And it's, and it's amazing. We've got practices who, I mean, I think the highest practice we've got is about $450,000 per wow. for a full-time employee. Good for them. We've got one practice who's striving for 600. Wow, good for and them. They're, and they are, they're focused on, you know, they're out in California in the sort of Silicon Valley area, wanting okay. to work with lots of tech companies. And I will say that the yeah. bigger you get, the harder it is to achieve that because yeah. you have all this other stuff. Right, and the yeah. whole group of non-billable people exactly. that eat away at everything. But it, it's interesting because there's, there's these kind of shifts that happen in the business from, say, three people. We often do it in powers of three. So three people then to nine people. Something happens there with what you were doing at three people no longer works what you're doing at nine. Yeah. And then from nine people to, say, 27, what you were doing at nine people now starts to break down yeah. at, and, then, and so on. And it... And it and it kind of means that, yeah, a lot of these things, the systems and the processes now need to evolve or, yeah. or adapt. So, mm -hmm. so we, we work with businesses. Um, there's a mixture of things where I might lead group sessions. So I'm training a lot of people in one go. Um, we have mastermind groups. Um, and then we have businesses that are all kind of in that 200 club. We have them kind of separated often in a thing called the design council where they're working um, mm. with, they tend to have a very different set of issues, more leadership, people-based problems, mm -hmm. um, getting team to perform, um, and also to start thinking long-term future yeah. How legacy. even grow, yeah. Yeah. Or, or yeah, or transition. Transition, yeah. legacy, retirement, even what that would look like, building an asset portfolio, how might a handover work? So, I mean, I personally, I really enjoy the transition conversations and think sure. that's a really fascinating Thing. And I think it's very powerful when a business starts to kind of build that into their culture of identifying the next generation of leaders, what yeah. they need to know, they need to get trained up in the world of, of business. Um, and then, you know, the kind of exit strategies for the current current partners that gets them focused and starting to think about profit and money and the legacy that they want to, to leave behind. And, you know, it kind of becomes very, very meaningful conversations. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, that's the kind of the sort of evolution that we deal with. As far as some of the show topics go, um, you know, I'll, I wrote down a few here that I, you know, I I do listen to your podcast a lot. Uh, I mean, you've covered everything from negotiating to we talked about ownership transition, architect as developer, growth strategies, compensation, client software, project management, design, marketing, innovation, construction, collections, fees, people, purpose. Uh, recession, getting paid, um, psychology, smart buildings, um, what success looks like for owners. Um, and I, I wanted to pick a couple topics here. You know, I'll pick one and then maybe you pick one as we kind of begin to wrap up. Um, I was fascinated by this idea about getting paid. So of all the things we do great at Mancini Duffy, as I can tell you, we can, we can, we obviously are very innovative. We sell our, we, you know, we can sell our services. We win lots of projects. We're busier than we've ever been. We know how to grow revenue. We know how to make profit. Um, you name it, we do it really well. I'm not saying we're perfect by any means, but the one thing that we absolutely suck at is collecting our money. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's an industry wide thing. Um, it's a constant pain point. We feel like broken records to the project managers. And, you know, I can, you can tell you hear it in the, in their head, like, here we go again. Mm. I know, I know. Yeah. Um, we're going pencils down. We're not doing this. You know, we're putting a lien on somebody's property. Yeah. Um, there's all of that. But what I found fascinating about one of your conversations was that you, you really encourage people to have that conversation about getting paid separate from the fee. But mm. actually physically getting paid like that check mm -hmm. um, with your clients before the project starts. Yes. So talk a little bit about that. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, so, I mean, this, the, the reason why we really got into this as a, as a topic was because this was the, one of the biggest problems we were seeing with practices. Yeah. We had a practice. I did a, I did a survey amongst mm. our own clients of how much um, outstanding AR people had. Yeah. Sick me. I was shocked. <laughs> 
I was shocked. I mean, it was it was more than fifty percent for most practices. Oh wow! It was it was crazy high. Oh, we're not that bad, thank God. And, <laughs> and uh, it, it, well, we we had one practice who the the worst the worst I've ever seen was they had about two million dollars of outstanding fees that hadn't been paid, and their annual revenue was only about one point two five. Yeah, this is causing some serious late nights and and stresses. Yeah, and so you, you kind of. Well, what was interesting was it was always the 80-20 rule of distribution as well. So the sort of the bigger numbers were with 20% of the, of the, of the clients. And most people, most people on average, we had around about $50,000 $50, if you averaged it out amongst the group, uh, which is still an enormous yeah. amount of, of late payments. And New York is yeah. just the worst place. So the clients <laughs> in New yes. York, the, the working with the developers. And, and it, it became very clear, and I, I did some interviews with some developers here in the city who were kind of discussing about how developers leverage their risk. And they know that they're very aware that architects are not going to have those kind of negotiations up front with them about payments. They also know that the architects are not going to preempt late payments in terms of well, okay, I know this developer is going to be late with payment because that's what their business model is. They're yeah. waiting for money to come in. So how can we turn that into an extra revenue opportunity so that I'm now, I'm, I'm, in, I'm consciously engaging in the risk that the developer is taking and I'm going to be remunerated for it. Mm -hmm. So structuring a deal where, okay, if what we can do here is you can pay me on time and that means you pay me at the beginning of every month and we'll do it like a, a kind of flat billing method or a subscription billing method. And we're not going to just start any work until we've got the fees in. And that will cost you, let's say, 100 grand to do that. Or I know that you, in our conversations, you've told us what your business cycles are, that you haven't got liquidity at the front end for the soft costs. We can postpone until here when we get approvals in place. And then you'll be able to get more money out of it. And we're going to charge you 150 grand mm -hmm. for that service of, of us being a bank, basically. Mm -hmm. we're, we're going to cash flow it. Yeah. So, so that becomes a little bit of a different way of sort of approaching it, where we're, now we're starting to preempt it and preempt the cycles. Or you could take it even further to, to, for it being risk. We've got one client who she takes a base level of pay from the developer up front. Okay. And then she'll get paid on a bonus structure per unit per uh, per what they can get onto the site. Now, she has a very specialist niche where she understands a very specific part of her community and town and is very confident, has even been involved in actually writing the zoning laws oh, wow. in okay. the in the area. So she it's not she know she knows the risk that she's that she's taking to be able to do that. But then she gets paid um, you know, maybe two and a half, three times more than she would what she would have gotten paid. She's protected herself with, with getting a base rate that's coming in that's on a kind of flat billing subscription model we like to call it, where no one does any work until the money's coming in that's great. From, from and it's paid up front, and that's what we do. And we have that as a conversation at the very beginning. You know, we, we do a, a thing called the permission step in the sales conversation, <laughs> and one of them one of them is you say. Two reasons why some people may choose not to do business with us. Number one, we're very expensive. Number two, we take X amount of fees up front and we bill like this. Are either of those going to be a reason for us not to continue this conversation? Right. And so it's it's right at the early stages of a of a sales negotiation, and it invites the objections there and then. And then it, it, it's it's there, it's tabled, and you don't have to answer everything now. But you've kind of You've thrown that out there and you can gauge what the response is. And if it's a complete deal breaker, then you, now you're in a situation where do I want to, do we actually want to work with this kind of person then? Because it's such a risk for us to take on these kinds of projects, not get paid. When we're not getting paid by this one client, that means that we can't hire, we've, we're mucking around, it's draining resource from the team, it's stressful, we're, you know, we're not able to, are we charging interest on it? It's just yeah. a, a whole big issue where that energy, time, resource, and money could have been spent working with another client or finding other clients who would be more profitable, more efficient for us. So that, that kind of principle of in the negotiations earlier uh, up front to have that conversation, to bring it up and to have a kind of, it's not always the pleasant part of a, a yeah. conversation. It's, and hard, it's very hard. It, and it's, and it's, you know, and we'll, 
we'll rehearse these conversations with clients. Like we'll sit down with them and oh, that's great. and and do them so they're practiced and you know we'll throw curveballs at them. What happens if they say this? What happens if they say that? And just practicing it gives a lot of kind of grounding and confidence. And then people can, you know, they come back the next week. And they're like, oh my god, <laughs> I, I, I did it and I said it. And yeah. the developer looked at me and said, mm, okay. All right, and that's it. Now, and now we got it. But, and then, but then that's the, only the first part, because now we've got to reiterate this mechanism that we put in fr up front of a payment schedule, and keep training the client to it. So yeah. we have another thing called an expectations meeting. So before the project actually begins, we have another meeting which is going through the agreement that we've already we've come to, how the payment schedule works. Ideally, we're divorcing the payment schedule from deliverables okay. so that we can continue always Just, march no. on and get paid, Absolutely. which means that the project keeps its own pace and yep. it keeps the, the client under, under control. We have another client who invented a thing called a completion bonus. So this is a practice up in on the West Coast, work with lots of high net worth individuals and kind of they were riffing off this, I this idea of making sure we get paid on time. And they negotiate a percentage of their fee which gets put into an escrow account every time they receive income from a client on a particular project. Oh, wow. And so they might take, let's say they, they're charging, I think they're, they're charging around sort of 15, 16%, so quite high fees on kind of you know beautiful $5 million houses and above um, on that Northwest Pacific coast. And they'll take uh, a kind of a slice of that 16%, maybe 1% of the total construction budget and put it into an escrow every time the client pays them. And they call it a completion bonus. And at the end of the project, if the client has behaved themselves and has paid them on time and they haven't had to chase for any bills, if they've given them permission to publish the project and take photographs, if they've done made decisions in a timely manner, then they get that money back. Yeah. And often the clients totally forget about it. And he was given an example of, um, you know, they came to the end of the project, they wanted to take the photographs and the client said, nope, we, don't, we want absolute privacy. We don't want anyone taking photographs of it. And they were like, ah, you might remember our completion bonus. We've got a quarter of a million dollars sitting here in a bank account for you. We're going to hold on to that. Then you've, you're forfeiting what time do you want the photographers to come around? We'll make tea for them. I love it. I love so, it. But, it but it's, it's kind of like, you know, the important part here is to negotiate and to identify the leverage, the leverage points that we can have with the, with the clients and also to stick to them. Because that's the other difficult thing. I mean, I always remember at Rogers, they had one partner whose sole job was to enforce contracts. And he was a, he was a bulldog. bulldog yeah. He was absolute bulldog. And I remember we worked, for, worked on a project um, and the client didn't pay and he just stormed downstairs and he said, nobody touch anything to do with this project until they've paid. Yep. Go outside, go walk along the river, <laughs> have coffee. We're not doing anything until the client pays. Mm. And it was, that was like, right. You know, and, and he had a, it was him and he had two lawyers on his team. Oh, wow. That's so great. It, it was very, you know, kind That's of great. So as we wrap up here, is there anything we haven't covered that you want to tell our listeners? Probably loads. <laughs> I know there's get, a lot. Get, there's get, a, we could go on for hours I'm, for sure. I, I, I think my my main message is always to really fall in love with the business aspects of architecture practice. And architecture business is not an easy business to to run. There's lots of complexity with it. There's lots of people that we're dealing with. We're yep. often dealing with really financially sophisticated um, clients who know how to negotiate. They know where they can push on leverage points of their consultants. They know how to leverage their risk onto us as the architects. And it really is a, a kind of industry-wide effort that we must become responsible with the business aspects of because of, it will benefit everybody yeah. and it will reposition the architect to you know being the ones who are truly deeply trusted advisors in the construction process and it will make everything a whole lot a whole lot better sounds good so one more thing is you have to promise me you're, you'll return to the u.s uh, next summer so we can go to the bruce springsteen absolutely concert in new jersey when yes. he's back on tour for sure so Ryan, thank you so much for being my guest here on the Anti-Architect Podcast. Um, and honestly, thank you for a great podcast that you guys host. And it's a, it's a great service for our industry. Um, uh, to learn more about Ryan and the business of architecture, check out businessofarchitecture.com. 
um, Ryan's LinkedIn, his Twitter, and obviously um, listen to their podcast because it's better than mine. Thank you so much, <laughs> Christian. Absolute privilege being here. Yeah, awesome. And that's a wrap. And one more thing. If you haven't already, please do head on over to iTunes or Spotify and leave us a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show and we'd love to get your feedback and we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of and what you love about the show already. Hey, a quick note. This is Enoch here and I have a question for you. Do you know someone who's highly professional, loves speaking with people, and is skilled in the area of professional selling? Well, if so, I'm looking for a director of enrollment to join our team here at Business of Architecture. This is a sales position. And if you or someone you know wants to impact an industry and earn an excellent income doing so, head on over to businessofarchitecture.com for more information. Have you ever been frustrated with architectural photographers who aren't reliable or don't capture your projects the way that you'd hoped? Visit TobinDavies.com or BOAPhotos.com to book renowned architectural photographer Tobin Davies to photograph your next project. Tobin Davies travels to your location and specializes in architectural photography for modern, design-focused architecture. Again, visit TobinDavies.com or BOAPhotos.com to get more information or book your shoot today. And tell them you heard about him here on the podcast for a complimentary package upgrade. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.